Okay. All right, I'm going to try and uh, do this uh, efficiently. We'll see if we can get ourselves a little caught up here. So I'm going to talk about um, the, the motivation for thinking about IL-18 as a potential target in um, these sets of diseases. Um, and it starts with um, a patient that we took care of at CHOP. Uh, she presented to CHOP uh, at two weeks of life with some emesis, some fever, some rash. Um, a workup at that point in time um, was positive for parainfluenza virus, so it was thought that this was just a parainfluenza infection. You know, you'll get over it, it'll be fine, go home. Um, she went home and then came back to CHOP about two weeks later uh, in severe extremis, um, had to go to the resuscitation unit in the ER, ended up in the intensive care unit um, with the same kinds of features, diarrhea, emesis, fevers, rash. Um, I happened to be the on-call weekend doc um, and went to see her in the intensive care unit. And in reviewing the case, um, you know, it was clear that her labs were consistent with um, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis like phenotypes. So she had cytopenias, she had very high ferritin, um, she had organomegaly, lymphadenopathy, um, the fevers, the rash, and so it looked a little bit like HLH. But the other predominant piece of her presentation was this horrible enteritis. So bloody diarrhea, um, vomiting, inability to take um, um, PO uh, intake. Um, and the, the slides here just show a little bit of her clinical features. So you can see the rash. Um, she had an endoscopy which showed um, these, let's see, do I have a laser pointer? Yes, these plaques and ulcerations in her esophagus and other parts of her bowel. Um, this is an example of her colitis. This is an example of gastritis and duodenitis, and um, um, we worked her up even though she's female and makes it less likely to be uh, FOXP3 deficiency. We stained for FOXP3, and that was normal. Um, and so it was clear that she had this panenteritis, this HLH-like phenotype, um, and, uh, and, and that was a somewhat unusual presentation, except that I recalled uh, Scott's uh, paper um, from about nine months prior where he described these activating NLRC4 mutations that resulted in this um, clinical syndrome of HLH-like uh, disease with panenteritis. And so we sent off a rapid uh, whole exome uh, and two weeks later confirmed that the, the baby did indeed have uh, this exact same mutation of NLRC4 as the families uh, from Yale had with their uh, NLRC4 disease. So we established a diagnosis of um, NLRC4 MAS. And then the question began, became, you know, how do we treat this, this sick baby? So, um, uh, you know, we made this diagnosis. Um, and she was actually sick um, for quite some time. I know this is a complicated slide, and just for the sake of time, I'll try and step you through it real quickly. Um, we tried all the usual things that were described in Scott's paper and in uh, Neil Romberg's paper. Because it is a disease of the inflammasome, um, uh, whose job it is is to make IL-1, and since there were clinically available IL-1 blocking drugs, it, it doesn't sort of make a lot of logical sense that that might be the first drug that one might try. And of course, we've all talked about steroids plenty already this morning, and so of course, that's our usual go-to as well for patients that are really sick. So in the beginning, she got um, she got a lot of, let's see, I advanced and I didn't want, oh, I'm messing up. Here we go. She got a lot of steroids. She got some anakinra. And you can see here, this is fever. This is ferritin. This is CRP. This is hemoglobin. And this is oral intake. And it's not really improving on, you know, buckets of pulse steroids. And again, this is in like a six-week-old baby. So we're worried about the medicines that we're using in, an, in a young um, child. Uh, the anakinra, cyclosporin, none of it's really helping her fever, none of it's really helping her ferritin, none of it's really helping her CRP or other parameters. Um, lots of sort of variations on this theme over the first two to three months of her life, um, even upwards and going on four months of her life, and you'll note from the slide that this whole time she's on TPN, she's not being able, she can't take anything by mouth, even if we try a little bit, bloody diarrhea, horrible emesis, it was, it was really very challenging. Um, so approaching month five of life, you know, we're beginning to feel pressure um, because she's been sick for quite some time. Um, she's not doing well. Uh, and so we decide to sort of just break everything out that we can. Um, and so um, that's this green shaded area here. 
And during that period of time, we gave really large dose steroids, even larger doses of cyclosporin. On top of that, we add, on top of her, um, um, or we had changed at that point in time from anakinra to canakinumab, but still IL-1 blockade. On top of that, we added megadose infliximab, megadose vetalizumab, which is a drug that's used for inflammatory uh, bowel disease patients that uh, blocks an integrin to keep T cells from entering the gut. Um, and then just, just for the physicians in the room to give you a sense, the dose of infliximab was 20 milligrams per kilogram every five days. The dose of vetalizumab was um, the, the maximum dose every 10 days and we were giving canakinumab as well every five days. So we really, just in a sort of act of desperation, this was done with you know, IRB consent and approval and consenting the, the family so they understood what we were doing, but you know, it just gives you a sense of how sort of everyone was feeling desperate. Um, and it was, it, we made a dent with that kind of craziness, right? So you can kind of see the fevers sort of come under control, the ferritin at least kind of plateaus, Maybe there was a, a CRP response. Maybe there's a little bit of a hemoglobin response. But it was still, even over that period, and we tried this for a good, I think, two to three weeks, um, still completely unable to tolerate PO. So we, we, we realized that we still weren't in a place that we needed to be. And so it was at that point in time that I sort of said to the team, I'm like, look, we know what NLRC4 does. It does two things. It makes IL-1, makes IL-18. We have blocked the hell out of IL-1. It's got it, guys, it's got to be IL-18. Um, and the problem was, is how do we address IL-18? We didn't really have a clinical agent to do that. And so um, we reached out to um, a, a company um, in Switzerland, AB2Bio, who actually did have a uh, drug IL-18 binding protein, or tautokinetic alpha, that um, is able to block IL-18 that they had used in a few patients um, uh, uh, in a small trial in adult onset Stills disease. Um, and I told um, AB2Bio our patient's story, um, and they agreed to sort of to consider compassionate use. And so while we've been dogpiling a little bit on the FDA, I would actually argue that this is really an amazing example of exactly what Rashmi was talking about, because this was a coming together of pharm pharmaceutical company, the physicians, the parents and patients here where, you know, we, we had to do real informed consent. They understood the risks involved. Um, they understood the potential upsides involved and agreed, despite a lot of angst and nervousness, that they were going to try this drug that had never been given to an infant before. And, um, and the FDA, who, you know, when I sent in the um, 1571 forms and whatnot for the compassionate use, it was, I think it was 7 o'clock at night on a Friday. And I thought to myself, there is no way that there's a federal employee working at 7 o'clock at night on a Friday. And I was, my jaw hit the floor when about three hours later I had an email from the FDA approving the compassionate use. So clearly there was somebody working at 7 o'clock on Friday. The FDA does in fact care about these patients. And they provided this sort of 24-7 service to take care of this baby. So I think that it's, it's a great example of this model of all of these different interests coming together to do something. So the, the red line represents when we started Tata Kinnig. And it was, it was a pretty dramatic response. I mean, just as the caring physician, I can tell you within 48 hours, I knew the drug had worked because for the first time ever, the child was smiling, she was sitting up, she was, it was just like night and day. But it, it sort of bears out in the, in the data as well. So you can see the ferritin starts to drop, the CRP drops, the hemoglobin comes up, she's now eating. We were able to wean off all the other medica medications. The child just remains now on IL-1 blockade and IL-18 blockade. It's now about a year and a half later, and if you were to look at her, you would never know that this was a child that we all thought were going to, was going to die in our intensive care unit. She looks like a normal, essentially two-year-old baby. It's a, it was a pretty remarkable response. So, um, you know, we can measure. Yes, sure. So, so I wish I could. I have to be honest with you, I don't know all the details. And unfortunately, AB2Bio uh, and, and the representatives couldn't make it to the meeting today because of some personal issues. But, so I don't, I don't know all the details. Um, um, and, and it's an ongoing um, effort. So you know, I, don't even know, um, I don't even know that I can tell you about like, outcomes yet or whether it's working or not. Um, um, and that, but you did have some safety. But there was, there, was, there was some initial safety data, which also helped, I think, a lot in... Um, allowing us to try this, for sure. I mean, it would be a very different scenario if this was truly, truly first in use. I, I agree with you. Um, so I think we were lucky in that regard. 
Um, you know, we can measure biomarkers, and you know, I, I, and I think you're going to talk, Freeze, you're going to talk about CXCL9, I presume, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it just for the sake of time. It's a biomarker of interferon gamma activity, which is probably important in LSA4, and you can see that uh, that, that went down with treatment. You can see that the patient's free IL-18 levels went down with treatment, and then this is essentially demonstrating that the recombinant IL-18 binding protein could be measured in the patient's serum. Um, and you see similar changes in the stool as you do in the serum. Okay, so maybe, let's see. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, sorry. So uh, CXCL9 goes down, free IL-18, and then IL-18 binding protein goes up. And that's overlaid on the ferritin, so you can see the change of ferritin over time with all that. Correct. So I'm going to talk about uh, free IL-18 in a second, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So just, again, for the because I know it's a mixed crowd, IL-18 is one of a number of IL-1 family members, including IL-1 beta and IL-33. And actually, my personal research is all really about IL-33. That's what I love, but I'm compelled to tell you about IL-18 because of this impressive clinical story. Um, I don't have any data in humans yet on IL-33, so hopefully my molecule will also someday be up here. Um, but IL-18 is really important for inducing um, um, interferon gamma from both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Um, and the biology of the IL-1 family members is reasonably well understood. We understand the receptors. We understand the endogenous antagonists of these proteins. We understand the signaling pathways. And it provides us you know, sort of whole sets of targets for um, therapeutic intervention. Um, this just is an example of, of how IL-18 biology works. So you have to transcribe the IL-18 gene. That results in a pro-protein that is activated by um, caspase-1, which is an enzyme turned on by the inflammasome, like NLRC4 and LRP3. That produces active IL-18, which can, which can then act on T cells to make interferon gamma. And then there's this IL-18 binding protein that can bind to active IL-18 and make it inactive. So you can target it through this. You can target it through any of these pathways. So there's a lot of sort of points of intervention. And what the drug that we used was is essentially a recombinant version of this to sort of convert all of the free IL-18 into inactive IL-18. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. 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 Correct. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I guess I, I, certainly I agree. Um, you know, and this isn't systemic J, obviously, that we're talking about here. We're talking about NLRC4. But, um, you know, I think that um, a lot of the things that we think about is, or a lot of the data that we have decided that is going to tell us what's a key driver and what's not a key driver have come from studies from peripheral blood. Um, and uh, I think there's an increasing recognition that uh, that may not be the most appropriate place to look. Um, and I think, again, I don't know what Fabrizio is going to say, but hopefully we'll present some of those data. Yes. Sure. So, okay, I'm going to burn through them. Here we go. I'm going to buzz through it. So, so we can come back to that thought. All right, so, so there is relevance to systemic JA. There is data to suggest that IL-18 is elevated in systemic JA patients that are predisposed to MAS. So I think it is worthy of some consideration. Um, what's really important is being able to measure the free IL-18 and not the bound IL-18. So if you do a traditional IL-18 ELISA where you have a sandwich pair of antibodies, you'll capture all of the free IL-18, That's what, that which is bound and that which is unbound. So the real biomarker, or the real thing that you want to measure is free IL-18. So part of this whole process was the development of this assay. And so instead of using as a capture an antibody, what you use as a capture is the IL-18 binding protein itself. So then what happens is everything that's bound bounces off. Everything that's free sticks to your IL-18 binding protein. Somehow my IL-18 molecules got messed up in conversion to this computer, so now my antibodies aren't going to line up. But you come back with antibodies as a detection, and now what you found is free IL-18. And the ability to measure that is really the true marker of whether 
adding any more IL-18 binding protein into the system is going to do anything for you or not, right? So I think this is another great example of having the right biomarker for your drug development becomes really important because measuring total IL-18 is probably insufficient. Measuring free IL-18 is really what you want to do to decide whether your drug is worthy of use or not. And free IL-18 does appear specifically elevated during MAS in a couple of different conditions. Um, and so that's my IL-18 story. And I just wanted to touch on, because Rashmi asked me to have a slide on challenges in orphan disease. We've talked a lot about this already. I'm not going to belabor it. Heterogeneous presentations, small numbers, the pharmacoeconomics of treating rare diseases also, also unfavorable. Um, one thing I just wanted to bring out is that we all sort of worship at the altar of the alpha error. Um, and, you know, I think that it would, uh, I think it would behoove us to think about alternate ways. And listen, I'm a math nerd. I eat R code for breakfast. You know, I love statistics. I'm not disparaging statistics. But I think in rare disease, particularly when you go to the extreme of what if you have your own private mutation, your own private disease, and you're an N of 1, you shouldn't be punished for that. Um, and so I think we need to think about other ways of how do we decide on truth in a rigorous, quantitative manner besides a p-value. Should we consider using Bayesian statistics for some of these orphan diseases? I think these are some discussions maybe we can have in the panel discussions. So, I'm going to stop here, and we'll try and keep ourselves on time. <laughs>